FaZe are in many ways an ideal team to pick players from to play in fantasy esports at a site like esports pools because Nico and Guardian are going to be MVP type candidates and doesn't really matter the map that they play on pretty much. And they're, they're going to do well no matter how FaZe plays at a tournament. So that's going to help you. Then you've got to consider people like Rain and Olafmeister. They have off tournaments like at Epicenter. Therefore, their numbers are going to go down and they'll be cheaper at certain future tournaments. But we know Olafmeister does very well on the maps that FaZe is actually playing the most and likes the most. And Rain is very solid across a bunch of the maps. Therefore, you can get these players at cheaper values, but they have chances to have big numbers along with those big hitters. Then you've got to consider FaZe is also an ideal team to bet against in on esports pools esp.bet if you can find a team that appears to fit enough of the criteria that i'll outline and if enough of the conditions of phase you think will happen so phase is a team that has played four land tournaments now with this lineup they won two of those the two in the middle undefeated not a single map lost but they failed to make the playoffs the first one dream at malmo and then the more recent one epicenter We've seen them play a lot of maps now. They've played 82 maps total online and offline, 31 of those online, 51 of those maps online. Their strengths are now fairly obvious. We've now been able to identify a number of their strengths because we've seen in the wins and the losses and the LAN and the offline games, but on online rather. But the weaknesses were less apparent because until Epicenter, they had their first ever tournament that they did badly in, but still won maps off teams and still had close games. And were kind of upset by a surprise Gambit team that no one knew how to play. And then they won the other two tournaments undefeated. So it was hard to pick where the real weaknesses. All you could do is look at the maps they weren't playing and go, if, if they were to play that, well, now they've played all these maps. So first of all, biggest strength for FaZe, insane fragging, obviously, with the superstar names. Nico's one of the world's best players, if not the world's best player, MVP candidate every tournament. Guardian has become very good again. Now, listen, he's not very good in the same way as when he was the dominant player in Na'Vi because the whole game was based around him and he had a massive amount of freedom at the time. Now he has some freedom on the team side but especially when you look at him on the CT side he looks a lot more like a traditional opera like he holds an angle he doesn't move all around the map as much and be as mobile and take crazy shots and re-peek into people quite as much as he used to do and in fact some of the rare times I've seen him do that for example in the overpass game against Team Liquid at ESL New York in the final that's actually when it looked a bit shaky because they don't have a whole team set up around him like he used to have in Na'Vi when he did that so he's amazing now but as an opera. So certainly candidate for world's best opera, but an opera, not necessarily like world's best player candidate in the same way. Rain is very solid, therefore you get big fragging out of him, and obviously he has an all-round game as well. Olaf Meister is a lot more up and down, but because he's so good on the three maps that FaZe are fantastic on, he can tip you over the top and make you unbeatable, hence why they have so many wins where they don't just win, they rampage over opponents. And then in Carrigan, you've got a great in-game leader who's especially talented, as I made the point in my snipe video, at makeshift styles where you call adaptively on the fly and based on what your star players are doing and you come up with quick things quickly, what you come up with as tactics quickly that you're just going to use in this one game because you scouted the opponent. And also, crucially, he uses his pick man. First of all, to protect you, he's managed to really do a good job of out, out of mind gaming opponents with bans and picks to keep phase off their danger maps. Therefore, they haven't had to play them very much and therefore they've been undefeated at some of these lands. And more importantly, he uses the picks and bans also to throw enemies off so that their pick become becomes a bit weird. And most, most famously, at the two lands that went undefeated, he got opponents to pick maps into phase that he wanted to play that were phase's strongest maps. So another great quality to have. Now let's look at the weaknesses though. I, I think you can define the weaknesses in four separate categories you've got map pool which definitely has still not been entirely exploited but we're seeing the weaknesses now you have looking at the specific losses and what caused those you have player strength as it's tied to which maps they're good on therefore we can see which players underperform which maps become open and likely to be upset or beaten on and then we have opposition matchups like it doesn't matter all these three first qualities if the opposition can't play the right maps to beat phase or doesn't have the right style to beat phase or doesn't have the levels strength level of players to be able to beat phase it's not going to help them much that they have the other categories understood but they, they can't apply the formula so we're going to look at these areas and then afterwards, I'm going to compose what I call the ultimate formula to beat FaZe. And listen, very few teams have that. So generally, we're just looking for who can fill out some of these aspects, and then they have the best chances. So first of all, let's look at FaZe's map pool. So on land, they've now played all seven maps because they finally played Cobblestone. Of the seven maps, they've only won five of them so far over the four lands they've played. They've won Inferno, Mirage, Overpass, Cash, and Nuke. They have never won on Train, and they've never won on Cobble. Now, of the five maps that they've won on, 
Inferno Mirage and Overpass are very good. These are really strong maps. Inferno Mirage are insane. They've won 7 out of 8 on these. Inferno, I would say, is their most dominant because their sole loss was still very close. They've shown they can just absolutely roll over that map on both sides, but particularly an unbelievable CT side. And then... You can see, also I think that's a map, by the way, that really plays into the Force Spies because there aren't as many crazy long-range distances. A lot of the, even the long-range angles are cut off so you can sort of make them work in half of the angle if you hold to a wall. Then you've got to consider, they go to Mirage, very dominant on this map. Admittedly, SK manages, managed to beat them convincingly, but that's SK and that was one of SK's strongest maps even with Fops in the lineup and particularly because it really opens the game up for Fur to be a monster on both sides. Then you go to Overpass, another really dominant map. This is the one map they've been truly destroyed on on land because obviously you had SK absolutely annihilate them. With that said, that map absolutely plays into CT aggression from, o from the guys on SK and particularly Fur again. So really, Fur and SK are accounting for a lot of what's happened on some of these rare losses they've had. Therefore, you know, not that, not that kind of telling that they're not dominant on these maps. They're absolutely amazing, arguably the best team in the world on all three of these maps now. Then they've got a fourth map that they win on. In fact, they've never lost on it on LAN, but they look a lot more suspect, especially when we then later con consider the online form, which is cash. Now, they've won all four games they played on LAN, but first of all, they've only looked strong against the really weak teams, and against the good teams, they've been really close games. So I would say cash isn't really a map that particularly suits them. They can win on it, but first of all, it's a skill map, so they can win on it by virtue of skill, but it doesn't suit their style necessarily. They can't put those oppressive CT holds on that they used to on the other three maps, and therefore they're definitely weak on this map, or not necessarily weak. They're not weak because you, not everyone can beat them, but I would say that they're vulnerable on this map, but here's, it's interesting enough, though, there's not many teams in the scene love cash and want to go to cash. Therefore, it's tough to exploit them at this point in the map pool. Therefore, it's probably going to be a decider or they're not going to play it. They can obviously choose to ban it themselves. Now, here's the interesting part, though. There are three maps that they've shown themselves to be weak on offline. With that said, they have only played these three maps offline a combined six times. So small sample size offline, but you'll see when we go to the online results doesn't get much better there, therefore we can draw these conclusions. So, on Nuke, they won once, but they got wrecked by NIP, and they had a close game versus Gambit, which they lost. On Train, wrecked by Gambo, Gambit at Malmo in the first tournament, and lost to Gambit also in overtime at Epicenter, but at least it got closer over time. They played Cobblestone once against Virtus Pro, who admittedly was looking a bit weak in general, and it was a close loss, so not too much to say about that one-off map. So if you can get them to any of these three maps, first of all, if you're good at cash and you can pick it, that's a great map for you, but you've probably got to have a high skill level. If you're going to play Nuke, Train, and Cobble, any of these maps, you definitely got chances versus FaZe. You absolutely do. They have been wrecked. They've had bad results. They haven't looked good in general. It's just people haven't exploited this part of the map pool yet because too many teams still thought, yeah, they're amazing on Mirage or they're amazing on Inferno. But you know what? We're good on Inferno or we're good enough on these maps. And too many teams picked into them or were just willing to play those maps. But then you go to the online form. Now, first of all, online, they've been amazing. Like, actually, it's funny that everyone's looking at Fnatic right now on EPL. You consider all the online maps that FaZe has played. Fucking hell, they're amazing online, actually. They're amazing offline, and they're even more dominant online in some respects. They've lost more because they play way more games, but the records are still nuts. First of all, they have a winning record on every map online. Now, a lot of that helps when you have just insane mad fraggers and you play an adaptive style. I think that's best suited to being amazing online. I think that's why some of the great teams in the past, like NIP, like old school Virtus Pro, actually not the modern one, the first year or so, I think of, um, who else would I say is very good online in the past? Oh, I've got to say the first Fnatic lineup, as in the one with Olaf Meister and Crims, the, the first truly great one. These teams had so much skill and played a fairly adaptive style that they were pretty good online the first few years. LDLC obviously was pretty good back in the day. Now, when we look at their online form, still amazing on Mirage, Inferno and Overpass. With that said, a bit less dominant on Mirage, had some close losses. Also, one of the key big losses was against Fnatic, who we still haven't seen offline that much, so it's tough to know how much stock to put in that. Was that specific to Fnatic? Did they expose any weaknesses? Doesn't really seem like it, and a lot of the losses that they've actually had in online form have been to Fnatic, interestingly enough. And, and it's unlikely so far they're going to face them in a semi or final, so that doesn't really help us in terms of how to beat FaZe. Then you've got to look at Inferno, still very dominant. If they lose, it's close. Overpass, very, very dominant, still very close losses, like one of their two losses online was to Astralis in overtime, arguably the best overpass team, at least until recently when they lost some confidence in it, and it's overtime. 
Then you go, but here's the interesting part. This is something that might allude to what might happen offline. <coughs> so cash is actually similar strength. Remember, that was the fourth map before. <coughs> that is a similar strength to, to offline, even though it looks like it isn't, because online they have a five to four record, but three of those losses were in the first four maps they ever played on cash online. So since then, they've been much better. Their recent loss was to Fnatic also. Again, a team we don't know what to make of offline. Seem like onliners at the moment, quite frankly. So actually, cash has also been pretty good online. So we can expect that it's playing into the skill elements. It's playing into just free form style play. And it's going to continue to be a good middling map for FaZe. But interestingly enough, Train goes from being a pretty bad map for them generally offline, that they can barely play, to being a map that actually is much better online. But then at the same time, they got wrecked by Envious, who offline aren't a Train team, and online can play it a bit. So that's a bit puzzling in itself, but it does show that they should be able to play Train. I think logically they should be able to anyway, because first of all, they've got Guardian. He's always been good on Train. He is a good player in it now. They've got Nico, who is just amazing across most of their weaker maps, actually. Therefore, he can carry them. So they're not going to be like purely beatable, but if you're some of the strongest Train teams in the world, I think this shows that while they can certainly play it and they're not just going to be a rollover, you've got to start playing this map against them. Because even online, we've seen a, a few weaknesses. With all that said... Even online, where they've played them a bit more, Cobblestone and Nuke still remain very weak, but people don't play them against them. Admittedly, obviously in Pro League, etc., you can use your ban, so they're able to stay away from them. But even though they have a winning record on Nuke and on Cobble, they have no dominant wins on Nuke. They had an OT loss to Na'Vi, who's hardly a good Nuke team themselves. They had no dominant wins on Cobblestone, and they lost their first ever game on it to NIP, who admittedly have always played Cobblestone and aren't exactly elite here at the moment. So Cobble's maybe not as bad. Problem is, most teams either ban Cobble or love to play it. There doesn't seem to be a lot of teams in the middle, and FaZe certainly wants to ban it most of the time, or will force the other team to take care of it. So we see the map pool gets a bit better online, but not convincingly so, especially the teams you're considering they're winning and losing against. Now, if we look at their strength based on which players are good on which maps, here's what's interesting. <clears throat> so take the strong three map pool that they have, which arguably they could be the best on all three. Inferno, Mirage, Overpass. On these maps, Guardian is very strong. He's good on all three of these maps, but particularly Mirage and Overpass, just like classic Na'Vi 2014, 2015, 2016, Guardian is fucking bonkers on these maps and a big time player. And the fact that Guardian is so stable and so reliably good means those maps aren't going to fall away as their best maps and they're not going to fall away from them being the best on those maps. Interestingly though, on these three very, very strong maps, Nico is a lot more absent than on the other maps. In fact, he's better on the other maps. The, the, their other players are just so good on these ones, he doesn't get noticed as much. Now, he still gets his numbers every tournament, so you know he's not bad in any sense, but he's not relied upon, actually. The best player in the team is not relied upon on their three strong maps. You go and look, though, Olaf Meister, good across all three of these maps, particularly on Inferno. Interesting enough, his addition on CT side Inferno has really seemed to add a lot to the team, and obviously, he does seem willing to play more of a role on the T side and not have to be the ultimate playmaker that he was in Fnatic. So, Olaf Meister is a key element to how they do on their strong maps, so keep your, keep, it, keep your eyes on the tournaments where he has bad tournaments, such as Epicenter, and you will see on their strongest maps, they get a bit weakened, and what did we see at Epicenter? They lost on all these maps, didn't they? They, they had all three of their streaks beaten, they were undefeated on these maps coming to this tournament, they lost at least once on each of these maps. Then you go, Rain's pretty solid across these maps. So, okay, at the moment, Guardian, he's reliable. We know he's going to be very good. Olaf and Rain, in a weird way, counterbalance each other because Rain being solid is what you generally expect. You don't expect the monster numbers. So even if he's off, Olaf Meister's up and down, but can be on. So odds are one of them's going to be on. Hence, they're probably going to remain very strong on these three maps. And Nico, if he's a backup or just some lesser figure, he's so insanely good. First of all, some of these games that statistically the others are carrying, when they fade out, Nico's still there. He's still an amazing player. But it is interesting that he's not that present on these maps in terms of who's the best. Now we go down to what I said offline is the, the fourth best map is Cash. This is basically Nico hard carrying. Now he was always amazing on it in mouse sports. He's fucking unreal on it right now. He's really, really good. Rain Rolfmeister, pretty good. Guardian doesn't really factor on this one. That's why I think this map is a lot more attackable because on this one, first of all, every now and then you'll get lucky. Nico won't go off. So Guardian is not as relevant. Already you've got a team that isn't as crazy in terms of the fragging as the normal phase you're facing. 
But Nico is good enough still to carry this against a lot of the teams except the elite tier, probably. Then you go to the train, Luke Cobble, troublesome kind of trio at the bottom. Funnily enough, rain is a lot of what allows this team to be solid and good on these maps. But more than that, Nico is hard carrying across basically all these maps. He's the main reason why they're getting any wins and getting in these games. So that's where having arguably the best player in the world as a backup at times, actually fucking what a mad insurance policy that is. That's why they don't look absolutely weak on these maps. But that is somewhat reliable. You don't want a team, especially if you're a very well-rounded team of fraggers, not in terms of style, to just have the one player who has to carry you. So that's why it's more attackable in this sense. Nico and Rain doing so much for you on these maps. And interestingly enough, just as I said, Ray, Nico's a bit absent on the, the main maps. Guardian actually disappears on these maps, particularly on Cash, on Cobble. Funnily, it's weird that he's actually disappeared a bit on Cobble, because traditionally that was obviously a great map in Na'Vi, and he was a fantastic player on both sides in that map, and really defined how you play some of that map. So, I think when you factor all this in, FaZe has made their style and their name with this lineup for heavy CT side domination. Now on T side, what makes their T sides look good, and in theory, their T sides are good, but they're not the best, is that they're so good on the four spies and with CZs and Deagles. So you think to yourself, well, they're getting the numbers, they're getting the rounds. Yeah, they're doing that from skill though. What's amazing about them is they're heavy CT sides. Like they're winning by having this insane fragging and they've got, as I saw, when you spread out the maps, different players are good on different maps. So they have players who, I'm the best on this map, you're the best on this map, therefore they spread out, they get the heavy CT side wins and then that's when they're near unstoppable. But when they go on the T side, if they don't win the four spies, sometimes happens. If they're on a map where some of their players aren't as sick, there's definitely some like that. And more importantly, when they're in setups where they can't just brute force and use skill to take over areas of the map, their executes and their utility usage, actually surprisingly not that good for a team that's been so dominant and is potentially going to be the number one for a few more months to come. So now let's ask ourselves, how do you beat FaZe based on this? Right, well, first of all, you can go ahead and start with the maps. So SK Gaming, by the way, did not give you a blueprint for how to beat FaZe because they did it the fucking hard way. Remember the series they played? They played them on Inferno, Mirage, and Overpass. The last two were in the other order. So they played FaZe on their best three maps and they managed to win two out of the three. And by the way, still got convincingly beaten on Inferno. So SK did it the hard way. And first of all, new lineup with bolts. You can't scout that really. Secondly, FaZe had yet to play. SK in an offline Best of X series. We all know Carrigan's history, not being able to beat Fallen. They've obviously got a mental block to some degree. I don't think, it's, I don't think that's why the games went that way. I think the games absolutely were played out the way they should be. And SK obviously has a fantastic mix of very strong fragging and especially with Fops out of the lineup, still very strong fragging, but attenuated by a bit more team play as in the FNX era of the past. So they kind of bridge all aspects in that way. So SK didn't give you a blueprint. SK maybe showed themselves what's possible. So taking the SK equation out of it, because they're the outlier, first and foremost, you want to be able to play train because we know since Cobble's very weak, they're banning Cobble if you play it at all anyway. So if you play Cobble, then they're going to ban it. That opens up train. If you can pick train, any team that can pick train has a shot right there if they're a pretty good team. If rain is having an off game on one of these maps, then you also get a double chance. Rain having an off game and I can pick train. That's actually a clear win. Anyone who can get those conditions can now get a map off phase. What's another good condition? Be very good on cash. If you're very good on cash, you've got a chance. Problem is at the moment, so few teams are willing to pick cash, especially into a team like a phase. So unfortunately, that's going to end up probably at best as a decider, but it's still going to give you a chance if you've got a decider on cash. Finally, another thing you can do, but just no one does it at the moment, is if you can pick nuke. If you can pick nuke, and by the way, you probably also have to be able to play cobble because otherwise they'll ban nuke. Then again, you can do this. Problem is at the moment, the, the world's best teams on nuke, basically everyone except VP, just won't pick it. Like for some reason, North won't pick it. For some reason, Astralis doesn't want to do it. Even the team, I, I think NIP is one of the few teams who might if they play them on land, but NIP has to get to these fucking lands, which doesn't really happen at the moment. So let's look at the actual teams. The problem for Astralis is they can't push train and make this a key element because as we saw last time, Carrigan knows they don't want to play Cobblestone. So he can force them to give up a ban of Cobblestone himself, knowing they'll ban it. And instead he can go ahead and ban train himself and therefore never have to face train initially. And they're going to end up on an overpass or something like that. So I feel like Astralis, the little fix they need to make to have a real good formula to beat FaZe is when Carrigan doesn't ban Cobblestone, just go ahead and don't ban it yourself and go ahead and pick whatever you want at that point in time. Pick Nuke or something like that. That would be the obvious thing to do. 
That also means if they go the normal route of we can't have train because that's gone, you only have the options between really overpass and nuke. And they've shown they don't want to play nuke. And if you play overpass interface, you play into their hands, aren't you? And then you look at North. North would have the map pool to do it for sure. But North, for some reason, MSL seemingly refuses to pick train or nuke interface. He just believes he can win on Mirage. And they're obviously going to ban North's cobblestone. G2 is a team that has a lot of options to do it. They have a great map pool to do it. Their problem is they ban train themselves. That's troublesome because you need to be someone who's letting it in the pool. You don't want to be taking, essentially giving FaZe a free ban. But within the context that they ban train, they could pick nuke and they could either pick cash or get it as a third and they're good on both these maps. That actually sets G2 up to be a pretty good team because think of the maps that FaZe wants to pick against G2. Inferno, good map for G2. Have a good CT side on it. Overpass, good map for G2. CT side's a bit dodgier, but still good. Mirage is actually, used to be their permanent. It's now a very sleeper pick for them. They've gone like 5-0 and zero on that on LAN or something ridiculous. So actually, any map that FaZe picks into G2, G2 has a shot on. G2, yes, if they're going to keep banning Train, but they can go ahead and pick a Nuke or a Cash, maybe even get Cash as the third. I actually see a world in which as long as G2 doesn't do something stupid, like let the third map be Mirage just because they're getting really good on it, I could see a world in which they can slant the veto every time they play it face phase. They obviously just have to be good enough to face phase, whereas we know G2's up and down. They might not even get to the series to play them. Team Liquid is a team that, unfortunately, I have to take out of the equation just when it comes to playing phase because their map pool of strengths is too similar. So while at one level, that means you're going to play maps that you like and they're going to play maps that they like. Okay, problem is if the better team should win that generally, and I feel like the heavy fragging style of phase intimidates the Team Liquid players a bit too much. So I don't see the upsets even as much, even though they're playing a similar map pool. It also hurts that while Team Liquid will play train, they don't seem to want to pick it and they're way too scared of cash and nuke for some reason, even though they can definitely definitely play nuke they've just gotten rocked on it too many times when they're on t side so they're too scared to go into the part of the map pool that phase doesn't want and they're going to stay in the part that they do and maybe they'll gamble on train which okay will give you a chance at least team liquid can, can force the cobble ban but they don't make any use of forcing it cloud nine's a team which interestingly enough actually has a better matchup against phase i think than team liquid because first of all they have good fraggers themselves so they're not i don't think I think they will be intimidated, but not as much. Like, I think Team Liquid's got very good fragging, but they want to play more of a team style. They don't want to go head-to-head -head with duels. I think Cloud9, one thing that's good for them is they can force Train or Cobble as a ban and pick the other, so they can have their map pick be a chance. They didn't do that, admittedly, at New York, but they can do it. Now, what they need to do is what they've done traditionally, which is always be decent enough on cash, because if you are, since they've never traditionally liked to nuke, if you're decent enough on cash... You can at least get it in the mix there. And now you've got two out of three of train cobble cash and you can play perhaps one at least, if not two within the series. And now you're cooking with gas. Now you can actually get busy and do something in this series and then add in that if you can live in a world where FaZe, for whatever reason, decided to pick Mirage, either as their map or the decider, you have a shot at it because Cloud9 always being good on it, new lineups good on it. I would still say they'd lose to FaZe, but they actually have a surprisingly good matchup. And actually, I'll mention one last team that you're going to be shocked. You're going to think, right, where, where's the left to go? <sighs> Na'Vi, Gambit. No, I mean, first of all, obviously Gambit because they've actually beaten them in a best of three and they've had a close best of three. Gambit has some weird maps, therefore they're able to play them on. I mean, Gamb Gambit's been able to look like they can beat them on Inferno and Mirage. Very strong maps for them. Gambit can obviously play Train and then things like Nuka are available. Gambit's a very tough team to riddle out at the moment themselves because they don't actually seem elite regardless. So I have to put them to one side, I'm afraid. NIP's the team I think is a sleeper to actually have a chance against FaZe if they can get to a LAN, if they can get them in series because NIP, we know wants to play Nuke and Cash. So they can go, first of all, and pick these maps because they've always traditionally played Cobble, you'd think. So if you can force the Cobble ban out of them, you get whichever you want out of Nuke and Cash. The bigger problem for NIP is I think they're going to have real issues on any of the phase maps. So they can get a map, they can maybe make it a three-map series, they can have a chance. It's just how are they going to win the series? It's less likely. Now, if we look at the strength of the phase team and the style, you either need heavy fragging to just go head-to-head -head with them, or you need great team play. Now, if we look at the teams that are out there, okay, heavy fragging, right? SK's fragging is going to be a bit more limited, although actually Bolt gets a surprising amount of frags. It's just they're not the same kind of like high... I wouldn't say high impact because actually his kills might be more impact in a way, but they're not like those straight up taking dual fights. Therefore, you're not just going to bully them from your T side with your SK, but SK has such a well-rounded approach. I'd say they have elements of both that they're immediately, obviously, not only do they have a good map pool in theory, but you put them in the equation here. Well, they don't actually have that good a map pool at the moment, but they've just been able to win on phases map, but they've got the style to beat them, obviously. 
I think Astralis still does. Astralis, what well, they lack a little bit of fragging. They make up for with great team play. Their problem is they haven't pivoted the map pool to help them at all. G2 has, in theory, both. But at the moment, actually, their fragging has been a bit underwhelming, I have to say, the last few tournaments. Like, last tournament was very um, promising because it showed shocks coming back at Epicenter. But otherwise, like... Apex is the reason they become amazing on Mirage. So that gives you an inside chance because you might end up playing that against FaZe. That's a big step up. But generally, they do rely heavily on Kenny S. And so unfortunately, their economy management limits Kenny S. So that's the problem with the heavy fragging sign. Do they have great team play? Right, They do in an intuitive sense, but they don't in like a conscious built-up practice sense. So I'd say they're more shaky on that. So funnily enough, G2 has the map pool to beat FaZe, even right now. But the other elements, they're a bit more iffy on or far more inconsistent. North, I actually think, has the great team play and has pretty good fragging and a good map pool. They don't exploit the map pool. And I think, unfortunately, when it comes to fragging, they do have good enough players to make it close. It's just that they don't have as many superstars. They only really have config and the rest are just good players. Team Liquid, I actually think, has pretty decent fragging, pretty decent team play. They just have no map pool to exploit. Cloud9 has good fragging, I think. Not as good team play. And they have a good map pool. It's just that, unfortunately for them they would have to be very bold with their picks. Whereas at the moment, they seem to pick for comfort a bit too much themselves. And so I can see a world in which Carrigan gets uh, some smart vetoes off against them and they only end up getting themselves one out of the three maps that they really have a shot at. And even then they can be outshot because they're kind of like a budget phase, right? Now, in terms of style of play, right, if you have a strong CT side team, then you can match FaZe's strength, which is strong CT. So first of all, we know SK, especially on Overpass, can have strong CT sides. There's a team that can match them. We know that... A team, and by the way, you don't have to match them with strong CT sides as in win 12 rounds. If you just get eight or nine, now you make their T side a lot tougher. They have to get a lot more out of their T side. That's why a team like SK can do it. Astralis, we know they can, but first of all, it's more predicated on the map. And secondly, they rely on heavy economy to make their CT side work because of how, not predictable, but how structured their setups are. They're not taking as many risky pushes. So Astralis certainly can, it's just more contingent. G2 definitely can have strong CT sides, but that is way more risky, and they are even more slaves to how the economy is going because they risk so much with the Force Buys. Now, you can also obviously beat FaZe by having a very strong T-side because then you limit the strength of their strong CT sides. They're not as godlike on T-sides themselves. You open up the door to potentially win. Who can do it with a strong T-side? Let's start with Astralis. We know they've got amazing T-sides. Admittedly, Kirby's form recently not being as good is a bit worrying because you need him for the entry aspects, but they've been so good generally. They've got a chance right off the bat, Astralis. North, we know they've got great executes. They've got those few tactics on their strong maps that they can run over and over again, as we saw in the E-League Premier Series and they can get gun round wins against them. That gives them a shot. Admittedly, they lack in some other areas, such as refusal to exploit the map pool. Therefore, they probably will still lose, but they're going to open the door to have closed games. SK Gaming, we know, can have strong T-sides, especially whenever Fur is on his game. Cold Zero is an amazing follow-up if Fur is strong. So that alone is enough to get you cooking there, and hence, we know SK can do it. G2, we know, can have amazing T-sides. Funnily enough, obviously, sometimes when they ride that econ low econ force by train, sometimes they're going to win those rounds because they have some skilled players and we know when Kenny S gets cooking and they have a good map pool. So yes, G2 can do it. And actually, this is one of the few areas where even though the map pool doesn't work for them very much, I will say that in terms of just having a good T sign, that's where actually Team Liquid can have a shout. That's why they can have close games potentially against FaZe. So now let's put it all together. What would be the ultimate recipe if we had to design a team to beat FaZe? Step one, they have to be able in some context to play Cobble because that can then force Carrigan to make it his permaban, not something that he floats like he does against Astralis. They should play one or two, probably two out of these three, out of Nuke, Cash, and Train. If you can play Cobble so they ban it and then you play two out of these three, then you can pick one of the weaknesses of FaZe and you can perhaps battle, depending on what you do later, to get it as a decider, although that's going to be tougher. But if you play all three of these, you can definitely get one as a decider. Then you've got to wait for the games, because these are going to happen, where Rain has an off game. Because first of all, when he has an off game, Inferno and Overpass become easier for you to play against them. So if you're already very good on Inferno and Overpass and Rain has an off game, you have a crack at FaZe's map pick. When he's off his game, Train and Cobble become very weak now. So now if you can play Cobble and Train, and you're picking Train because they're probably going to ban Cobble if you can, now you can win Train. So you can win Train, you can potentially win their Inferno or Overpass. You're in with a chance already in a series. Step four, have a good Mirage, Inferno, or Overpass. Now for this one, no, it's not all of them. Just as with the Nuke Cash Train, 
ideally one or two. If, you, if you're very good on Mirage, Inferno, or Overpass, they're going to pick one of these three. You've got a chance right there on their map pick. Therefore, you don't even always have to go to three maps. Number five would be either have very good fraggers, so you can go head-to-head -head with their normal style, or have great team play. Therefore, when they aren't able to get frags to get into areas because you covered them off properly and played off each other with great two-man games and great backup, great utility usage, their utility isn't as great for map control. They're not as good at running actual set strats. They're going to improvise a lot more, and that's what two-man game, that's what structured CT setups are able to battle, counter, and respond to. Finally... If you want to have the ultimate chance, have a great T-side. I won't say have a great CT side because you don't want to go head-to-head -head with someone and be a worse version of them. Have a great T-side, you limit their CT side, and then they're forced on their T-side to do a lot more. And in that setup, whether you've got good fraggers so you can go head-to-head -head with them, or you've got great team play, therefore you can counter their T-side fragging, you're in with a shout already. So let's look at this ultimate recipe and ask ourselves, which of the teams that we've got actually fit this? Right, well, first of all, you've got to say G2 immediately. Like I said, they've got the map pool, they play cobble, they play nuke and cash, they don't play train. If they wait for rain to have an off game, we know they can get wins on Inferno and Overpass. Cobble's available. They actually surprisingly have a sleeper mirage, which somehow has turned out to be good, but they're also good on Inferno and Overpass. They have good fraggers, and they have decent if team play, depending on how the game's going. And at times, they have great T sides, right? G2 on paper, actually, is the team that should beat phase. SK fits a lot of these qualities. We know they play Cobble. We know they play Cash and Train. The problem is they haven't been slanting the Veto. I feel like if they do that more, they up their chances. They can obviously wait for Rain to have an off game because they've got Fur and Cold Zero. They have a good Mirage. They ha don't have a good Inferno, admittedly, so that's a problem. But they have a good Overpass, so Mirage and Overpass. If you're Phase in theory, you don't want to pick these into them. You want to pick Inferno. And then you've got the factor that they have good fraggers and good team play and a pretty good T-side. Maybe not the best, but a pretty good T-side. So G2 and SK are the clear candidates who should be able to beat FaZe. Gambit obviously has beaten FaZe a bunch, so you put them in the mix, but I don't think it's as replicable a formula even for Gambit. North could, but don't exploit the map pool. Astralis have to either be willing to gamble playing Cobblestone, or they have to force the veto by picking stuff like Nuke and allowing stuff like Cash to be a decider at times, not always going into an overpass or inferno and just hoping you can win these maps. Then finally, Team Liquid, I think, has some of these qualities. They play Cobble, they play Train, in theory they play Nuke, they just won't go into these in that general, and they're too good at the moment on Mirage, Inferno, Overpass, therefore they're willing to play those maps too much, especially Inferno, which is the map you, it's the one map you definitely don't want to play against FaZe, and unfortunately, that has been the map that Team Liquid's built this recent form on, winning over Inferno nearly every time, so they almost go straight into FaZe's strengths, and hence FaZe is set up for a solid 2-0 every time. So unfortunately, refusing to play Nuke and Cash is what's costing Team Liquid the chance at the moment. So G2 and SK are the obvious ones, Gambit the historical one, Astralis and North could switch, Team Liquid C9 less likely, even though C9 actually could at least get a map off them.